八遍跳，八遍跳，八遍跳，八遍跳。It's hard to lose somebody that you love so much. Fred's brief life is so interesting because he had a high degree of self-acceptance about who he was. Didn't want a label. Wanted to wake up in the morning and say, "Who am I going to be today?" The masculine and feminine together are sometimes reflected so completely in the body of one person. It's as if they have two spirits. Half woman, half man. They call it Nutley. He goes, "Oh, so cool! I'm a Nutley." It was so horrifying and tragic to me to think this beautiful kid reduced to this. Fred was poor. Person of color lives in a remote area. You do the math. In the life of this place we call America, there is nothing more traditional than two spirit people. We were getting married here long before it was a glimmer in the eye of Stonewall. He really wasn't breaking rules. He was simply trying to be himself, and bless him for it. Place where two discriminations meet is a dangerous place to live. Fred Martinez demonstrated with others like him that gender identity, sexual orientation, and biological sex fall on spectrums. And that acceptance in societies ranges from reverence to murder. So, what is two spirit? Two spirit is the modern umbrella term to denote an American Indian who does not fit into the male-female heterosexual spectrum. It replaces the European given name Burdash. Burdash roots in Persian, which means slave or kept boy. And eventually, it made its way into French and Spanish to derogatorily describe a passive male homosexual. The Spanish conquerors, European traders, and the missionaries saw two spirits as sodomist, violating their Christian principles of absolute gender and sex. This ethnocentric bias, combined with economic desire for the resources natives possessed, set the conflict theory in motion. Biological sex and the ways people engaged in sexual activity were mostly not a concern to American Indians. The important part was how each person fulfilled a socio-economic role based on their gender identity. The term two-spirit might be new to some, but modern society is familiar with some of its conjugates: gender queer, gender fluid, pan-gendered, and transgendered. These are terms that reference a person's gender identity. It's important to note that both then and now. Gender identity is not the same as sexual orientation. Gender identity is socially constructed, with American Indian gender roles fulfilling both a symbolic interaction and structural functional aspect of culture, economics, and society. Two spirits were seen as possessing a wholeness of woman and man, which allowed them to be somewhat superhuman in ability and thinking. A tribe's livelihood centered around two things: the spiritual interaction of the group with nature. And gendered activities for economics and social status, because two spirits embodied both worlds. Having a two spirit among the tribe was very important for spiritual reasons and for mediating between gender roles. Behavior, clothing, activities, likes and dislikes. For whatever was the gender norm for each tribe, a person who showed a strength in one gender 
that didn't match their biological sex was a two-spirit. Third and fourth genders consisted of people who held one biological sex, but didn't gender identify with either male or female. Rather, they are a blend of the two, thus existing as another being altogether, occupying third and fourth genders. For the large part, American Indian culture never sought to eradicate or punish two spirits. Instead, two spirits held special places in society. Woman Chief, a crow third gendered woman, was a unique mix of male and female. She pursued masculine activities, becoming one of the best riders, shooters, hunters, and warriors of her people. She led war parties, hunted on foot, and butchered the meat, returning with it on her back to camp. At one point, she supported four wives, attesting to the wealth she accumulated. Out of the Crow's 160 lodges, she held the third highest place and also held the fifth highest position among Crow chiefs at an intertribal Crow and Cree council. She could go no higher not because of her sex or gender, but because of family social position. The American artist Alfred Jacob Miller documented women hunters in 1837, both in art and writing. Miller described what he saw. No sooner does she reach the animal than she must watch his every movement. Keep an eye to her horse and guide him. Must look out for rifts and buffalo wallows on the prairies. Guard against the animals forming an angle and goring. Manage bow and arrows or lance, and while both are at full speed, to wound him in a vital part. To do all this requires great presence of mind, dexterity, and courage. And few women are found amongst them willing to undertake or capable of performing it. This is Wiwa of the Southwestern Zuni, the most famous male-bodied female-identified Native North American Two-Spirit. She accompanied anthropologist Matilda Cox Stevenson in 1886 to Washington, D.C., where she charmed the Washington elite and President Grover Cleveland at their annual society ball. She also visited private estates, wowing everyone with her artisan skills, pottery making, storytelling, song, and dance. Wiwa was highly valued by the Zuni. She was a caretaker of children, a medicine woman, a mediator, a craftsperson, and provided guidance to those who sought it. She was considered the most elegant, strongest, and intelligent of her people, which is why Wiwa was selected to go to Washington, along with a few others, to represent the Zuni's interest in protecting their land. Everyone accepted her as a female, for no one but Stevenson knew Wiwa had been born male. Grover Cleveland invited this Zuni princess to the White House, where Wiwa set up her loom on the lawn and dazzled everyone by making a blanket. Another male-bodied two-spirit, Oshtish, or finds them and kills them, was part of the respected Bote tradition of the Crow. He spent his time with women or others like him, but got his other name in an emergency role reversal. In 1876, he put on men's clothes and joined Crow warriors against the Lakota during the Battle of the Rosebud. His new name, Finds Them and Kills Them, denotes his success in battle. But in everyday peaceful life, Osh Tish wore women's clothes and practiced women's crafts. U.S. agents of the Bureau of Indian Affairs had long had a plan of du jour discrimination and subjugation of native ways, especially regarding gender and sexuality. They tried to assimilate Osh Tish to change to men's clothes and to cut his hair in the early 1900s. In 1982, ethno-historian Walter L. Williams visited Joe Medicine Crow, the last Crow chief, and someone who served in World War II, at the Crow Reservation in Montana, and asked about the forced attempts to assimilate Oshtish. The next day, Joe Medicine Crow took Williams to the outside of the Bureau of Indian Affairs office, where they walked along the trees that encircled the office. Joe Medicine Crow said, One agent in the late 1890s tried to interfere with Oshtish, who was the most respected Bate. The agent incarcerated the Bates, cut off their hair, made them wear men's clothing. He forced them to do manual labor, planting these trees that you see here on the BIA grounds. The people were so upset with this that Chief Pretty Eagle came into Crow Agency and told the agent to leave the reservation. It was a tragedy trying to change them. Along with the nationwide government campaign, Christian missionaries also condemned two spirits. Between government and religious prejudice and discrimination, eventually the sacred role of the Two-Spirit was suppressed, and for a time forgotten, but Two-Spirits as people lived on quietly. 
Now with over 135 North American tribes documented with multiple genders, research and time is proving against the oppressive past that this was a diverse land, accepting and enriching its own people with the diversity that springs forth from the natural. Recent Native American revivals of the traditions are also reviving the role of the Two-Spirit through community action, social networking, gatherings, conferences, media, scholarship, and education. Randy Burns, co-founder in 1975 of Gay American Indians, says in the book Living the Spirit, We are turning double oppression into a double opportunity, the chance to build bridges between communities, to create a place for gay Indians in both of the worlds we live in, to honor our past and secure our future. After viewing this, one might wonder, isn't it easier just to be a man or woman and be done with it? Not really. Strictly by gendered societies have always had those who didn't fit gender standards. When a person is forced to pick an absolute side, the world asks them to cut off a part of themselves. But in realizing that human beings are greatly diverse individuals, and our likes, dislikes, our appearances, our faiths, or lack thereof, in the end, to find a place in society is something we all aspire to. And by including, rather than excluding, does a society benefit from a diversity of minds? so that all the cogs in the wheel can make it turn. This is what the native peoples of North America understood. This is that spirit. To learn more about gender identity, please see pages 273 to 275 in our social world. Two Spirits will be broadcast on PBS Independent Lens, June 14th at 10 p.m. To see clips and learn more about Fred Martinez's story and the novel Nahlei, visit the PBS Two Spirits website. Find shame 